Welcome back. We'll start our coverage of this Washington sub-regional with the first matchup, the winner taking on Louisville. It's San Diego against Texas A&M Corpus Christi. 12-4 and four are San Diego out, way out on the West Coast. I'm joined by the voice of San Diego volleyball, Jack Cronin. How you doing today, Zach? Jack? Good, doing very well. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No doubt. It's great to talk volleyball. It's also nice to see those bubble teams like San Diego and Pepperdine that not a lot of the nation was able to watch in the regular season. We just saw those, you know, domination, 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 big match against BYU, big match against each other. So now we're able to really embrace this. It's going to be an early one though, right? 9 a.m. local time for that first serve. Right off the bat, when you saw the draw, what was what was your mindset? What do you think? Well, it's an interesting season for San Diego because, as you said, uh, technically, yeah, it's a it's a bubble team, right? Uh, but the West Coast Conference had three teams that were ranked in the top 25 all year. So simply because BYU uh, took the conference title, as San Diego had the season before, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a kind of a you know a crazy Cinderella type program. Uh, San Diego's a perennial top 25 team. Uh, no difference here this year. Uh, they, you know, they've gotten players back and they've worked their way back toward it. Yes, it's an early one, um, but for them, they've been in these kind of big moments. They, they're a perennial uh, NCAA tournament team and top 25 team. Uh, and so for them, it should not be as much of an adjustment. So there are pros and cons to the kind of schedule that San Diego had to deal with this year because it is extremely backloaded. Didn't really play much talent in the first 10, 12 matches of the season. And then you finish off the year two against BYU, two against Pepperdine, falling in three of those four. So you were you were watching, you know, you can fill us in. What was the difference between a win and a loss in those matches? Were they significant or were they a little closer than the score says? Well, the first thing for San Diego really is injuries. And obviously we're in a pandemic. Um, so they played shorthanded for many of those early season contests. Nobody uh, is a pushover in the West Coast Conference, a great volleyball conference. But as you said, the other two top 25 teams, they played in the back end of the season. And when they faced those two teams in four matches, winning, by the way, the finale on senior day against Pepperdine, uh, they played with no middle blockers whatsoever wow. uh, on the entire roster available for any of those four contests. Injuries and pandemic protocols uh, wiped out all four of their middle blockers. So they had adjustments. They had outside hitters who were playing in the middle. Uh, they had players out of position. Uh, and really, especially in that BYU contest, uh, didn't really have any answers for BYU in the middle, along the middle of the line. So that's a huge difference right there. They are working their way back toward possibly getting some of those players back here into the tournament. So to me, that's the first thing is that injuries really hit them hard with essentially one position group. It'd be like losing uh, all of your secondary in football, right? They hit one position group very tough. Uh, that's the first thing. And obviously BYU and Pepperdine are also very good. Uh, so it was a great, the Pepperdine contest were just great, evenly played matches, San Diego and the Wave splitting those last two. Those were a ton of fun at the end of the year. So it seems like it's a little bit of a two-headed monster, right? With, with Wiblin and, and Fayad, if I, if I pronounce those wrong, you know, correct me here. No, you did. It was great. Great job. Oh, fantastic. So talk to me about the, the, the identity, right? That San Diego brings. Is it, is it that two attackers that you have to stop? And if you can't stop those two, it's game over. Or are there some role players that really provide X factor kind of, you know, stuff? Well, again, I mentioned the injuries in the middle, but it's really been a depth position on the outsides. Um, there are three attackers. You mentioned Roxy Wiblin and Tanae Fayad, the two seniors. Katie Lukes, who is a junior, is also very, very good. And then on the right side, uh, you, for San Diego, Grace Froling uh, is impressive, too. So all four of those attackers can hit you at any time. So that position turns out to be a position of depth as opposed to uh, the middle position, which is hit so hard here by injuries down at the end of the season. So San Diego is not a team that has to rely on one player. Uh, they can do it with uh, at least those four weapons. Last season, we saw San Diego have a pretty impressive first round win. I mean, a team that is a top seed in the, in the tournament this year in Washington State, a four set win in Honolulu, a Hawaii team that is oddly out, you know, not in this tournament, no Stanford, no Hawaii. When you take a look at a bracket like this, and especially from a team like San Diego, it almost feels a little wide open, right? For a tournament that could be taken from it by a team that's not a seed. Uh, and, you know, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Because of the pandemic, there were no non-conference matchups this year for San Diego. It was strictly conference play only. 
Uh, you mentioned those Hawaii games from a season ago. They, they started the season with Hawaii uh, last year. They opened the season with them in a regular season contest, then faced them in the tournament as well. There's none of that this year. There's, it's just conference play only. You don't know how you stack up with national power teams like that, uh, other top 25 teams. You just don't know. And so things are very much wide open. Uh, and that could benefit a team like San Diego, or you could run somebody that you just don't know uh, what they're like. So really, uh, I think it's going to be fun to watch, as it has been for other sports in these delayed seasons, uh, like basketball, for instance. We just saw this in the NCAA tournament on the men's and women's side uh, for basketball. You just don't know. And going in, it provides a lot of exciting matchups. Yeah, I think that's the most anticipating part of this tournament. Well, San Diego has a win in three straight tournaments. We'll see if they make it for noon Eastern time against Texas A&M Corpus Christi for the right to play 11th seeded Louisville. Thank you so much for joining me, Jack. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. He's the voice of San Diego volleyball, Jack Cronin. Thank you very much. Now to the other side of the San Diego A&M Corpus Christi match. I'm here with the voice of Texas A&M Corpus Christi. He's Stephen King joining me now. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's going to be a fun one, right? A lot of people are loving the West Coast Conference, Stephen, and there's good reason for it, right? Three teams in the tournament. San Diego is an, a darling pick to maybe upset Louisville in the second round, but they're going to have to get by a team in Texas A&M Corpus Christi that became the first four seed since 05 to win the Southland Conference, making their third trip to the NCAA tournament. Walk me through what Coach Steve Green did, especially in these upsets in the tournament, right? It feels like they're pretty big upsets, no? Well, it, I will say this uh, about our, our league, and I think those top four seeds were, were fairly comparable. While Stephen F. Austin stood at the top, without a doubt, uh, you know, I still think that the, match, the, the, the comparison of the teams were very similar. We played Stephen F. Austin, the top seed, the number, uh, earlier in the year at our place, it was a five set match with a 34 32 set involved there. I mean, it was, it was nip and tuck the whole way. So we knew that we're definitely capable of playing with them at all times. We had the opportunity in the second round to do so when we were quite successful, but for coach green, it was uh, rather in intriguing, you know, because he, he has a, a lineup that he has really fine tuned and, and has done some amazing things with and made highly successful at certain positions, really good at the center position and faith pan hands really good at the libero position with, with Carissa Barnes. We have a couple uh, second team all conference selections in the middle and the outside as well. So we had that all going into the tournament. So we had we're very capable in certain skill positions and it's just like, allowing them to lead the team on the floor and he allows them to do so and they're successful doing it. So with a lot of these automatic qualifiers, I'll just ask, talk to me about your best player, but with this Islanders team, Chloe Simon wins the MVP. She didn't really get too much national recognition. She wasn't a conference player of the year of any sorts. You mentioned the libero of the year and the setter of the year. So walk me through the style of play that Steve Green likes to coach and maybe what, game flow we want to look for if you're an Islanders fan in this noon matchup? Well, with Carissa Barnes on the back line, along with her uh, specialists, uh, including Kaylee Payne and Angel Fallon, the, these these ladies just don't let the ball hit the floor. They do a fantastic job. And if and when things are in control, especially if they're working through Carissa, Carissa can get to everything, but if she's really in control, she likes to get it to the center quickly. Everything likes to move fast. Everything likes to use quickly. You're not going to see that elevated moon ball set for, for the Islanders. They like to work quick. They'll work it low. They'll work it fast. And with uh, the capability of, of our middles uh, being able to slide as well as they do, uh, as, as well as they're able to jump. We have one middle that just jumps out of the building in Hannah Froschel. She, she, she spikes over blocks. You know, we're really blessed in that regard. But I think we have enough weapons along the front that, uh, that Faith Panhands, the, the center of the year, she's got options. And for herself, she was just a couple, uh, you know, a couple points away from being the, the leader in hitting percentage as well in the conference. So she's a multi-threat. She can set every position, but you have to look at her as a scorer as well. So it, it's very multi-dimensional and it's, and it's really fun to watch. It was a thrilling five set win over Sam Houston. They took the second Sam Houston did take the second 36, 34 and Corpus Christi bounces back a two set, a two point win in the third. And then 
dominated by Sam Houston in the fourth, bouncing back again, 15 to 12 to take the fifth. You mentioned Panhands flirting with history. She almost had a triple double in that match with 62 assists, eight kills and nine digs. But I want to ask you, Steven, about just the experience from this program. They got to take on, they got to take on a Texas team this year that they hit 471 in the third and final set. They didn't take a set and they're looking to win their first ever NCAA tournament set. What do you think that Texas match might bring to the table in terms of a preparedness? I think that was, that showed a a level of maturity that I didn't even think they knew they had, you know, that they were able to go to Austin and compete as well as they did. Yes. When you look at the end, it said three, zero, but the way they competed against at that time, the number two team in the country, uh, that had to give them tremendous confidence. And and the way they went into the tournament and the way they played all three matches, it showed us something. We we fell victim to injury in the tournament. We had our starting right side go down with an injury before the first match even started. We, uh, and just, just unbelievable, you know. And then Chloe Simon, who you mentioned, went down in the fourth set and w- was living with a foot in the bucket. She was in the starting lineup for the fifth, and they were the, the, the official was looking at the players on the floor, and she was just getting her foot out of a bucket, you know, just to, to, to get her out there. And it was, it, was, it was amazing, but that showed leadership. I, I couldn't believe the senior were doing what she did. And one last thing in regard to her, when she went out with her injury, a freshman, like the only freshman we had, uh, you know, uh, goes in and she just grabs her by the face on the check-in and talks to her and just talks to her and just says, freshman, it's going to be okay. You're going to get it done. And just does this. I thought that was one of the most impressive things I saw the entire night is the way she handled her situation being injured and the way she prepared the freshman coming in. That's phenomenal. I do want to take a second here. I mean, it was a challenging season, right? For every team's medical staff, huge kudos, right? To the Islanders staff as well. Every single team has had to deal with the aches, the pains, and also the COVID scares here and there. Last question for you, though. I did mention looking for their first set win, 2016, three-set loss to Washington, 2015, three-set loss to Texas A&M. Is A&M Corpus Christi the kind of team, Stephen, that can get out to an early lead? Because we mentioned this before we recorded, it's a 9 a.m. Pacific time start for San Diego. So it could be one of those opportunities where if the Islanders can maybe step on it early, they could separate themselves. I think it's a distinct possibility uh, that that it could happen. We can, if we can get off quickly, I agree with you. If we can get off quickly, I think we're capable of finishing. That's one of the things that's scary. Some teams can get a little scared of the situation, get scared of the scenario, may see themselves in the lead and, and panic a little bit because, we, because maybe we weren't supposed to be here. I don't think that's what this team does. I don't think we have the players on the court that will be rattled. I think that they, if they're capable, if they're in a position to win, I think they will do so. Cannot wait for it. As I mentioned, one of the first matches, there's going to be a ton at noon on Wednesday. This will be one of them. I am looking forward to it. He's the voice of Texas A&M Corpus Christi Volleyball, Stephen King. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Daniel. That'll wrap up this match. We're going to move out to Towson against Dayton next. Now we head to the bottom half of this Washington sub-regional What should be a really good match between two teams that have been to the tournament, have played in competitive first round matches? It's Towson against Dayton. And I'm joined by Ben Rosenbaum, director of digital media at Towson. He was on the call for the CAA championship and the the tournament for the Tigers. There really hasn't been a ton of matches for Towson this season. So when you look and you watch them play, do they feel like they are still early in the season or does it look like a team that's, that's ready for the tournament? You know, I guess that uh, would depend on who you ask. You know, I, I mean, I know coaches could always find something uh, to pick at, but, you know, to a casual observer, to a broadcaster, to somebody watching, uh, I mean, they went 3-0, 3-0 in the tournament. Um, they didn't drop a set. So they look fluid. They look fluid. Um, a little rusty to start off, I think, in that first semifinal. But other than that, I mean, they look like a really good, just offensive swinging team and then it's hard to find holes sometimes with these guys. And I'm not just saying that because I work for Towson, but they, they do a great job. Yeah, they've lost one set all season. There's only been 19 sets, but to win 18 of them has to feel nice. Back-to-back CAA champions last season, a first-round win over in Penn State against American. And then you took a set off of the Nittany Lions. How much veteran leadership has come back to this team from, from the 2019 squad? Well, I think that's an interesting phrase. Uh, this is a team that doesn't have a senior. 
there's no seniors on this team right now. Wow. Uh, you do have a handful of returners, and I literally mean a handful. Um, I mean, Lydia Weirs is a monster, but just a sophomore. Emily DeRome, uh, who had the, uh, the uh, championship winning point two years ago, uh, she's just a junior. So I'll, other than that, there's really not too many returners that have experience. But I think this is a group that you know, has really been able to bond quickly and, and come together and they kind of do things by committee. There's really nobody like, oh man, we don't have a senior captain or anything like that. This is a team that knows how to play volleyball together. They know how to work together and they continue to find a way even with a bunch of new additions. What is the identity of this Towson team? I mean, you take a look at some of the stats and they're so deceiving because through just 19 sets, I can't tell how many blocks you want to see, I mean, you got 1.3 blocks per set for Smith. She leads the team. Are they a team that maybe lacks up at the net and, and superb in the back row? What's, what's their identity? I think that's kind of the beauty of this team. Again, it's hard. They haven't played many matches, yep. uh, but they, they, they can do it all. They can really do it all. I mean, you look at that championship match against Northeastern. Uh, you mentioned Diane Day Smith. Uh, hadn't seen much of her. She plays. But she doesn't, she's not one of those, you know, big name players uh, for us, just a freshman. Uh, she's somebody who came on late in that third set with three huge blocks to swing that set Towson's way, sets up match point. So, you know, this is a team that I think, I don't want to say finding their identity. I think they know who they are. It's just a matter of, I think the rest of the world still seeing it. Uh, I mean, this is a team that's going to come out. They're going to hit the ball. They're going to hit the ball accurately. They're going to defend. Uh, I mean, you look at the size up front with Weirs and Shai Chin. Uh, and Smith, they're able to get up there. They're able to get, you know, get some good net play at times. And, you know, at the same time, those names that I mentioned, and, and I, there's a whole bunch of other names I haven't said yet that offensively, you don't really know where the ball's going to be coming from. And they'll be playing at 3.30 Eastern time against a 13-1 and Dayton team, a, a physical, athletic, explosive team in, in the Flyers that will, will surely provide a little bit of a challenge. But Ben, I think the one thing that this Towson Tiger team is – you know, equipped for is the time in between matches, right? Because you went from March 7th, a three, nothing win over Delaware, Hofstra postponed, Northeastern canceled, Delaware canceled, West Virginia, which looks like maybe it was scheduled at the last minute, right? That got canceled. And then they finally played almost a month later on April 2nd. So they will be going 11 days. That's like nothing right between matches. There's going to be no rust for this team. Sure. And, and I mean, that's a big credit to not just the student athletes, but to uh, head coach Don Metal as well, finding ways to keep them fresh, finding ways to keep them fluid and, and, and in tune with each other. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, from my perspective as a broadcaster, I was wondering, OK, what is Towson going to do in this tournament, in the CAA tournament? Uh, they haven't played in a long time. They haven't been able to, you know, get in a match situation. And I think they kind of said, you know, a little bit of a slow start. Um, but once that ball got going and they picked up speed against Charleston, they kind of, you know, got into a groove of things. They looked fine. So I think, you know, it's weird to say business as usual in a COVID world, but I think right now Towson's in a business as usual setting. Like, like okay, we know who we're playing. We know when we're playing. It's just, let's get to match day. Great point. Great insight, Ben. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. He is the director of digital media over at Towson, Ben Rosenbaum, and we are going to head to Dayton and talk to David Jablonski next. Wrapping up this sub-regional, we're going to talk Dayton now. The Flyers are going to take on Towson, and I'm joined by Dayton beat writer for the Dayton Daily News, David Jablonski. David, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And so this team in Dayton, we see them in the tournament. This is the third straight year that the Flyers have made it to the NCAA tournament. One loss to St. Louis to start the season, and then 13 straight wins including a very impressive non-conference victory in five sets against their neighbors, Wright State, who won the Horizon League. Taking a look at this team, though, David, what is the X factor this season that could possibly get them into the second round for the first time in, in what feels like forever? Well, I talked to uh, Coach Tim Horseman uh, a couple hours ago, and the way the tournament is seeded this year could help teams like the Flyers because it's not being seeded uh, regionally, so they're not going up against – the teams that are closest to them uh, in the region, you know, they try to make short drives for everybody in the first rounds. This year with everybody in one place, you know, everybody's basically seated uh, in the order that uh, the NCAA thinks, uh, you know, who, who's the best down to the worst. Um, so, you know, Dayton isn't running up against a Penn State team that knocked them out twice in a row a few years ago. Uh, you know, they'll still have a tough match 
in the second round against uh, Washington if they beat Towson, but uh, maybe not as uh, tough as some of the past matchups they faced in that round. Yeah, good point. Towson is a, a tricky team to even study for, right? When you look at them, they've only played six matches. They've won all but one set. Dominant similarly to Dayton. So when you have two teams that are both riding high and, and you know riding those winning streaks, what do you think the X factor might be in a matchup like this? What are one or two strengths of this Dayton program? Well, the six matches is, is interesting. Uh, that's, a, that's a unique situation. So it's hard to say how that's going to affect things uh, in that first round match. But, uh, you, you know, it's got to be an advantage that Dayton has played uh, uh, 14 matches now. Um, you know, Thompson played three just last weekend, but um, Dayton has had a lot more time to, to get things together, to develop its freshmen, um, you know, to go through a more typical season, not anything close to a real usual season as far as number of matches, but much more than Towson. So I think that's probably a, a small advantage for Dayton. And then I also look at their schedule this season and see the amount of times that they've been tested deep into five sets, St. Louis to end the season in five. And then that right state match that I mentioned earlier in the season, that was basically scheduled. What was it the week of what was going on there in Dayton, where it was almost like a fan can say, Hey, schedule me the match. And then what do you know? We saw right state in Dayton. Yeah. I can't remember uh, exactly how that came about, but you know, they're separated by about uh, 15 minutes in Dayton and they play in almost every sport, uh, not basketball, but uh, not men's basketball, but it's, it's a natural rival and uh, right. State's got a lot of great programs. The volleyball program has, has come on strong, making the last two NCAA tournaments. So, so it turned out for both those teams, it was a, a great test early in the season. Yeah. A pair of programs that are used to winning. And so we can kind of wrap up this conversation by focusing on a few key players that just your average college, college volleyball fan may not be too familiar with, but when you take a look at this program and this team and the success at the top with Jamie Peterson, no matter where you're playing, especially in Division One, David, if you have over 200 kills, you're having a good season. Not to mention she's hitting 306. Yeah, she's a special player. Going to go down as one of the all-time greats in Dayton history, player of the year in the A-10, of course. Um, and so she leads the way. Uh, but they've got some other strong um, veteran players like uh, Bridget Doherty. Uh, a real strong freshman named uh, Lexi Almodovar, who comes from a, a volleyball family. Her dad was an IPFW, uh, Indiana Purdue, Fort Wayne, a Hall of Famer. Um, I was just talking to Coach Tim Horseman about her uh, before the eight ten tournament, and he was just so impressed what she did in her first year. Um, but down on the line, a lot of, a lot of big time players like um, Amelia Moore, uh, an all ten an all eight ten second teamer. So uh, Mara Collins, uh, a lot of a lot of great players on that team beyond Jamie. And of course, that coach of the year in the conference in Tim Horsman. What, I guess, what strategy, what kind of a coach is he? Is he one of those vocal, emotional, you know, live on the edge of the seat kind of coaches? Or is he more of a professional sitting on the, the bench most of the time, you know, keeping things composed? Well, when I talk to him, he's a very laid back and nice guy. Um, so I enjoy talking to Tim. He's been around Dayton basketball or Dayton, Dayton volleyball a long time now. Um, second stint here, uh, really, he, uh, he left for a couple of years to go to Maryland, uh, six seasons actually to go to Maryland, but came back and uh, just kept on building what he built uh, when he left, uh, you know, volleyball power in Ohio. Uh, they've been to 15 NCAA tournaments all since 2003. So you're talking about a, a regular uh, NCAA tournament um, participant. And uh, he's really uh excited about this team. He thought they could have played better in the A-10 tournament, even though they, they won both matches in, in straight sets. So uh, if they can take it to that next level, maybe get past the second round for the first time. Yeah, I got to love a coach that's a perfectionist. Nonetheless, I have no doubts that this Washington sub-regional will lack very little flair. It's going to be a lot of fun. David, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. He's the Dayton beat writer for the Dayton Daily News, David Jablonski. That'll wrap up this sub-regional.